on live. We're just going to check that that is actually working. Let's just check. Hopefully you can see it. Oh, yeah. I think that we are now live. So I'd like to say welcome um, to Meet the Matrons on this very beautiful sunny afternoon. It's a slight change of plan to what's been advertised. So this afternoon um, it's uh, Matrons and our Deputy Head of Midwifery that are here to do a, a presentation and answer any questions that you may have. So I'm going to introduce um, each one of us in turn. So my name's Emma Rigby. I'm the Matron for Maternity Outpatients. Uh, which includes uh, the general outpatient clinics at the John Radcliffe and at the Horton, and also the fetal and maternal medicine unit um, and the diabetes team as well. And you're probably very bored of me saying that because I say it each time I'm here. <laughs> and I'll move on to Laura Jones. So, hello, I'm Laura Jones, and this is the first time I've done Facebook Live. Um, and I am the matron for the maternity assessment unit, which is our triage unit, um, delivery suite, and for um, observation area, um, which is sort of next door to delivery suite. Um, and that, those are the units that I manage. Hello everyone, this is also my first Facebook Live. Um, my name is Bea Culligan, I'm Deputy Head of Midwifery for Acute and Tertiary. So that means um, all of the areas that Emma and Laura have already mentioned and also the area that Jane covers which is inpatients and bereavement. Hello, I'm Jane Eppram, I'm the Matron for Inpatient Services. Um, this isn't my first Facebook Live as those of you who are regulars will know. Um, I'm the matron for inpatient, so that's the postnatal ward, the antenatal ward. I'm also responsible for bereavement services. It's nice to see you, well, I can't see you, but it's nice to uh, <laughs> know that you're all out there. We currently have 11 people watching. That's great. So, welcome to you all. Um, I know that uh, quite possibly you're tuning in to see um, Wendy Hill, um, our community matron, and her team. But we've had a little swap around with our agendas. But if you do have any questions regarding community or um, anything to do with that, then we will do our very best to answer them. And if we can't answer them, then we know somebody who will be able to answer them so we can get back to you. Uh, but hopefully there will be um, things that uh, we, we can help you with today. So while we wait for questions to come in, and so do please put your questions in on the chat, um, we'll read them out and, and get the team to answer them. While we're waiting, we'll just run through a few things that maybe might be useful, um, that, that you may find useful. And I think probably the, the first thing we should talk about is COVID. And where we're at right now with visiting um, and, and what we're asking you to do when you do come into hospital and what we're asking your visitors to do. So who wants to start on that? Laura, do you want to talk about... Maternity, yes. Yeah. So um, on the maternity assessment unit, which is where you will... Um, it's our, your first point of contact often um, on, um, on, on the unit. And so with um, COVID, then... Um, we're really pleased, and I think you probably all know now that your partners can accompany you um, onto the unit um, when you come in for those uh, planned admissions. Um, we do ask you, if you can, to do a lateral flow um, before you arrive, um, and that's you and your partner, and you'll be asked that on the phone when you call us. But please, please don't worry. If for any reason you don't have any lateral flows at home, and I know some of you won't have lateral flows at home, we can do some lateral flows on you um, when you arrive. Um, and also for visiting now on um, delivery suite and um, observation area, you can have two people um, at, at the birth, um, which, is, um, which is a recent change. Hopefully that everyone has been informed of that, but now you can have two people with you. So when you um, move up to the ward after you've had your baby, um, your partner can visit during the hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And during that time as well, you can also have one other visitor. We ask that you don't chop and change visitors, that you just stick to those two people. That is just to protect you, the other patients on the ward and the staff. And we also ask that your visitors, so your partner and your named visitor, um, do a lateral flow before you visit the ward. Again, you'll be asked when you arrive um, to, to check that you have done that lateral flow test. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anybody feel that they've explained that one clearly? Yes. So we've got our first question come in from Hannah. And so she's got a question relating to having a baby after having a, a loss, a stillbirth. Is there any extra support available at the John Radcliffe um, after having um, I'm so sorry, Hannah, that you've had this experience. Um, yes, there is. We have something called the Rainbow Clinic, um, which is there to support women who've had a previous pregnancy loss. Um, so once you become pregnant again, um, your community midwife will put you in touch with this team, and they give you the um, support during your pregnancy, make sure you have the right scans, the right antenatal appointments, and follow the right pathways. Um, and they can also... Uh, um, have, you can have regular email com conversations um, or telephone conversations with the Rainbow team. So, so yes, that is in place. And I think the information about the Rainbow service is actually on our website, so you can maybe check that out. Thanks, Jen. I hope that answers your question, Hannah. Um, Sophie's um, popped a question into the chat. Um, Sophie's a breastfeeding counsellor at Abingdon Breastfeeding Cafe. Welcome. Um, and Sophie's asking, once a mum is on the postnatal ward, how is the feeding support set up? And when would the infant feeding team be involved? What should a mum expect, especially if she's had a caesarean? So three parts to that. Can you remember? <laughs> <laughs> it's like an interview. So I think the first thing to reassure everybody is that all the staff that work on the postnatal ward, and in fact in all areas of um, our service, have had infant feeding training, so that's um, so they have a knowledge and understanding of both breastfeeding and um, bottle feeding. So, whichever member of staff you come in contact with on the postnatal ward, they will have that specialist knowledge of um, infant feeding. With regards to the infant feeding team, um, they're available for people um, who've got more complex problems. So, if you've got a preterm baby, if you've got a baby that's got a, a, um, an abnormality that might need additional support with feeding. You've had to come back into hospital because your baby's lost weight or your baby's jaundiced. What was the last part of the question then? Um, what should a mum expect, um, especially if she's had a caesarean? Um, in relation to feed day? I think that's exactly it, yeah. Um, so she will get support from the staff that are on the ward. So that's both the midwives, the nurses, the maternity support workers, and the maternity assistant practitioners. Um, it's really good that any mum has prepared herself prior to coming to the postnatal ward. So, has joined the um, sessions that are done every Thursday by the infant feeding team, Facebook Live sessions, to have read as much information um, as possible prior to giving birth. I think sometimes it's very easy to focus on just the birth and the labour, which is obviously something you do have to get through. Um, and it, often you don't think about what's going to happen after that, so you get as much information as possible beforehand. And as I say, join those infant feeding live sessions on Thursday, they're great. Um, have we not also had um, some special cots delivered that are going only to bed, so it's easier to, to lift baby in the night than on So on the postnatal ward, um, mm -hmm. there are cots that um, do go over the bed rather than at the side of the bed, so yes, they are in place. So they do help mums that have had a C-section, mm -hmm. because often it's quite difficult to lift babies in and out of the cots. And then during the day, you'll have your visitors and your partner, they, they can also support you. Lovely, thank you. Sophie, I hope that answers your question. We've now got 33 people watching. Um, I think I'll just update uh, that it's a slight change from the, uh, the plan that we um, have actually got. Jane, who's the inpatient matron, Laura, who's the matron for delivery suites, um, maternity assessment unit, and OA, and B, who's our deputy head of midwifery, and myself, who's a matron for our patients, here to answer any of your questions. And that's for the people that have just joined us since the introductions. Um, we've got Hannah, who asked us earlier about the support available to having a baby after um, a loss. Um, and Hannah does say that she's in touch with the Rainbow team. Um, so that's, that's, that's really great. great. And she is, of course, worried about everything, and, and, but we know that Paula and Candice are going to give you the, the support that you need, along with your community and your wife as well. So if there are any questions that you have, do pop them into the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. We're just waiting for any further questions to come in. So sometimes what we like to run through is what to, what to expect when you come in. And it might be good to start with Laura. So what to expect when you come into the maternity assessment unit? 
So if you have to come into the maternity assessment unit, and some of you might already have some experience of coming into the maternity assessment unit, so we're like uh, sort of an A and E um, for maternity patients. Um, so the unit can get quite busy, especially sort of towards the afternoons when we get sort of referrals from clinics and GPs. Um, when you come in, so when you call us, um, you'll be triaged on the phone by experienced midwives and they'll actually sort of take you through a whole load of triage questions which can seem sort of a little bit laborious, so I apologise for that. It just helps in getting an understanding of do you need to come in, can we refer you to your GP, can we refer you to your community midwife, or when you do come in, how quickly do we need to see you? When you arrive, you'll be sort of clerked by a, um, um, but from one of our, ad, from the admin team, and then you will be seen by one of our maternity support workers, and she will do a set of observations on you, and then you'll be asked to um, take a seat in the waiting room, and then um, we 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 in on, we have a board where we where all the midwives know when people need to be seen, what time they arrive, and how soon they need to be seen. And then you'll be taken into one of our assessment rooms. You'll be seen by a midwife who will do a full assessment on you, will do a full assessment of your baby, um, and then um, uh, the, if you need to see a doctor, then a doctor will be called to see you. Um, just to let you know, and I, I'm sure you probably do know, the maternity assessment unit can get a little busy just because we're an acute triage unit, so we never quite know how many people we have at sort of any sort of given time. If you come in and you are in labour, you will be prioritised. So we aim to get we aim to get you into a room um, straight away. Sometimes we will have um, women who've got urgent needs, so they will be prioritised. So some women can feel like they're waiting for a long for a, sort of a, a, a long time. We try not to do that. We try and update you. Um, but if you are going to come in, um, if you can, sort of sometimes it's helpful just to bring a magazine with you, just to bring a drink, um, because I know that um, you know we you're sometimes waiting to actually be seen by the doctor, or you're waiting for we see you and we're waiting for your blood results to come back. So that's the maternity assessment unit. Jane, do you want to run through about what to expect in admission to the um, inpatient rooms? Okay, so if you, you could get admission um, admitted to the antenatal inpatient ward if you have a complication of your pregnancy and it's deemed safer for you and your baby to be actually an inpatient. So the inpatient ward is on level six. Um, it's a 25 bedded ward. It also incorporates the addiction of Lower Bay. You could, your length of stay um, is hugely variable from one night to weeks, depending on the reason for your admission. The ward is run by midwives and support workers, and you'll be seen by a member of the medical team um, each day. Um, postnatally, it's a very big ward, the postnatal ward, there's 43 beds. Um, you'll be looked after by a team of midwives, nurses, support workers, um, and maternity assistant practitioners. There's also um, infant hearing screaming team, there is discharge coordinators, ward clerks. Um, it's a very big team of staff that um, are responsible for your care. You could be in hospital for as short as one night, or depending on um, your recovery or needs of your baby, that could be extended for the number of days required. We aim to get most people home with around about 24 hours of admission, so most people stay for just one night. But um, if your baby is born early or has some um, additional needs, then you'll stay longer, um, such as antibiotics. Um, and a you've got some um, issues such as high blood pressure, again, you might need to stay a bit longer than 24 hours. Okay, thank you. I've got a, um, a question coming from Lauren, who is just about to qualify as a hypnobirthing instructor. So well done. Congratulations. Yes. Fabulous. B, this might be a question for you. Um, Lauren's asking, is she able to display a flyer in NHS settings, or is it not an option? So that's a really good question to ask, and it's a really good opportunity for us to explain um, our reasoning behind the answer I'm about to give. 
So effectively, if we're to display a poster within our settings, then that can be seen by the birthing families that use our services as an endorsement for that particular person doing that particular specialism. So we, we for that reason, don't display private uh, company posters or private business posters within our NHS settings. It's very important to us that the um, birth and families that use our service um, would do that research and make those decisions um, for themselves because each person will have an individual need as to what would work right for them and for their families and so therefore we don't endorse particular people doing particular things. Thanks, B. Lauren, hopefully that answers your question, but uh, as we all said, many congratulations on your um, qualification. So Victoria has popped a question into the chat, and just to remind anybody watching, if you have got any questions, just put them into the chat for our panel of experts. <laughs> <laughs> um, Victoria has, has asked, um, she's, well, she said she's planning to have her baby at the Spires. Will she need to go through to the midwife assessment um, first, the, the maternity assessment? Um, uh, yes and no is, 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 is the answer to that. So if you're, if you're planning to have your baby on the spires, then absolutely then you will call the spires and they will, um, they will triage you up there as to are, are you ready to go in now, can you wait at home, do you want to go in to be assessed. Sometimes at the moment if the spires, if the spires are busy, um, then sometimes their calls may be diverted to MAU and then MAU will take the call. Uh, but normally you will call the spires and you'll go direct to the spires if you don't have any other issues. Lovely. So Victoria, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and Lauren has thanked for the answer, B. That's great. We're up to date on our questions at the moment. No, maybe. I'd love you to yeah. <laughs> delivery suite. Thank you. That was my cue for delivery suite. Um, so delivery suite. So delivery suite is um, a, a, a high sort of a high risk unit. So quite mostly, if you have any problems in your pregnancy, um, then you will often be advised to deliver on delivery suite, or if you're requiring pain relief such as an epidural, then you'll be required to come to Delivery Suite. Um, so on Delivery Suite, you will get one-to-one -one care. So you'll have um, one midwife assigned to you. All the midwives do 11 and a half hour shifts. So they will be with you for the whole day. Um, so you, and then their shift changeover is at eight o'clock. And then you'll have a midwife with you if you're laboring at night, you'll have a midwife with you for the whole night. So on Delivery Suite, we have, um, I'm just trying to remember the rooms. I think we've got 12 rooms at the moment. Yeah, yeah so 12 rooms. Some rooms aren't in use, so I'm just trying to sort of visualize Delivery Suite as I'm speaking. So we have 12, 12 rooms, that so we can have 12 women in labor at any one time. Um, we have um, all stuff by, we stuff by midwives. We have band five, band six, Bad seven. We have a team of uh, very experienced coordinators who run Delivery Suite. We also have a team of um, consultants, registrars, and junior doctors who staff Delivery Suite. And then we have a team of MS MSWs. And when you come into Delivery Suite, so even if you're coming in and you are a high risk birth and you need an epidural, our ethos is to actually keep it as low risk as possible. Um, and to really encourage that sort of um, uh, lovely sort of um, nurturing um, birthing environment. So all the rooms have um, birthing balls in them um, and we're looking to order a whole load of new ones at the moment um, and we are looking at the room environment at the moment so watch this space so hopefully we are going to be actually doing some decorating work. Not you personally. Not me personally. <laughs> I, I just need to let you know, as you're on here, we do have a, a, a pool room on Delivery Suite, which at the moment is um, out of action. 
um, and we need to um, we need to get a new pool. So at the moment, we are looking at ways of how we can um, raise money because they're extraordinarily expensive. So we are looking at um, ways we can access the trust money, and then we're also looking about how we as a team can actually raise some funding. So if anyone's interested and want to join us, we're looking at a sponsored cycle walk, well, cycle ride. So um, just as I uh, put that out there. Um, and we've also got um, uh, an order for rocking chairs for each of the rooms. Yeah. And we're waiting to yeah. have delivered. So. And then we have bean bags and we have some um, sort of mattresses so that um, if you are there for the whole night or the whole day and your partner needs us to take a rest, then we have facilities for that as well. Thank you, Laura. You just dropped the cycle ride in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, it's just a thought. It's just a thought. I was thinking of a swim. Well, Louise of MVP did say that she, we were talking about abseiling because we have a, a charity which absells from the building and Louise said that she'd be more than happy to do that with us. It might also be worth considering what you could bring in yourselves to um, make your sleep comfortable. You, know, you might want to bring your own cushions or pillows in, um, refreshments that you know will... Um, encourage you and entice you to <laughs> get through your labour, um, fix your partner, um, these are all things you can just help think about in advance to bring in to help with your comfort. So we can't do candles because of the live flame and the oxygen in the building, but you could have battery operated candles, little battery operated tea lights, that sort of yeah. thing, anything to create that lovely home from home environment would yeah. be welcomed. Lovely, thank you. A couple more questions have come in. So Nicola has um, said she's due a, a cesarean soon. Can her older children visit once she's on the ward or are we still asking their children to visit? So at the moment we're still being governed by the Trust's COVID restrictions in relation to visitors, um, which at the moment says that children can't visit. Um, so as it currently stands then, then no, unfortunately your children will, will need to wait until you get home, which hopefully will be quite quickly um, in order to meet your new baby. Thanks, Jane. And uh, Leona has messaged us to say she's also hoping to birth on the spires, and she's due this week. She's had a low-risk pregnancy, but can't remember the policy in terms of going overdue. If she was to require an induction, would it mean that spires is no longer an option? Um, if, if she required intervention for her induction, then the spires wouldn't be an option. Um, however, if um, if if it meant that she just needed to have her waters broken and everything was uneventful, then yes, she could use the um, spires. So it would be something you'd need to discuss with your midwife when you came in for your induction. Um, up until the point of you actually coming in for induction, then yes, you can use the spires. <laughs> <laughs> so let's fingers crossed that you're going to use it imminently. Absolutely. So we're up to date with our questions at the moment. Laura, I keep saying, Laura, do you want to talk about, do you want to talk about uh, the observation area? Yeah, so um, the observation area, um, which is, it's, um, we, the observation area is where if you have, if you're recovering from your cesarean section, you've had to go to theatre, or you have a, 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 um, a, a, any time we're slightly worried about you, then observation area is um, a department that you might sort of visit. Um, and so that is, we have eight, nine, ten beds in there now. So we have two four-bedded bays, and then we have two side rooms. Um, and that is staffed by two midwives, um, we have two nurses, um, and then we have, MS, we have MSWs, and then you'll be seen by the medical team on a daily basis there as well. Um, and if you have, um, uh, if you come in and you're coming to have an elective section, um, then you may go either to observation area when you come out of theatre, or we have a, a separate recovery bay for low risk sections, and that's on that's on delivery suite. Lovely, thank you. And just to say that on observation area, observation area is the same as the wards. You have um, when you come out, then you have um, one visitor on observation area. 
Leona, who asked us about um, induction of spires, has um, said that that's already clear, so thank you for the answer. It's good to look fair with that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Just, um, we're up to date with questions, so just to remind anybody that's, that's watching that you can post your questions in the chat. I've got the matrons from um, the um, inpatient ward, from the delivery suite and MAU, um, and our deputy head of midwif midwifery as well here. So any questions that you have, pop them in the chat. Um, from an outpatient side of things, just wanted to say about um, visitors or bringing somebody in with you. Currently as a, um, in our outpatients department, we can only just have one person coming in with you. Um, as it stands. So for the inpatient areas, you, you can have two visitors, but for outpatients, it is just one person with you. Um, and, and the same as, as the rest of the trust, no children currently. So we are up to date with questions. Would it be helpful to just talk a little bit about postnatal and what will happen on the ward? Fabulous, thank you. So once you get um, admitted to the ward, as I said, um, it is very hugely as to how long you're going to stay. Um, we do aim to try and get you home within 24 hours of arrival. Um, each morning you'll be seen by a midwife or a nurse who will do some examination, an examination on you to check that all is well. Um, that's for both you and for your baby. Your baby will also um, see a member of the hearing screening team. Your baby will have an examination by a specially trained midwife um, who will perform a full physical examination of your baby. You may see a doctor. You may need to have um, drugs prescribed for you um, to take home. So all of these things take quite some time. So when you do go home, um, it's often later on in the day because of all these things that need to happen first. Um, things that I've said to people in the past is um, it's really important if you need any pain relief to um, ask um, your midwife for pain relief whenever you need it. If you're offered pain relief, then think really hard. You know, is this a good opportunity? How long is it since I've last asked for pain relief? Maybe now I should have some. Um, if there's anything that you need, if you arrive on the ward and you realise it's sort of two o'clock in the afternoon and it's going to be some time before you get your next meal, but you haven't actually eaten anything very much since you've given birth, um, because you've been on delivery suite, then please ask the staff. We have a 24 hour service where we can provide food for you. Um, it's absolutely fine to say, please can I have something to eat. We will facilitate that for you. Each ward has um, tea coffee making facilities and facilities to have um, soft drinks. Again, if you don't feel quite up to being able to make it to the trolley yourself, please ask and someone can bring you refreshments to your bedside or your partner or your visitor can go and collect that for you. If you need anything, if your bed needs changing, um, you miss the bed changing um, opportunity in the morning and you realise um, that your actually bed needs changing now, again, please ask. Often when your, sheet, when your bed's been made or your sheets are covering your bed, we you can't see if they've been stained um, and they need um, refreshing. Again, just please ask the staff. They're very happy to accommodate anything for you. Um, but because the ward is busy and because they often don't see things directly, we do need you to, to ask. That will help us greatly. Thank you. Thank you. We've stunned everybody into silence <laughs> because there are no questions coming in. Maybe it's just we're just answering everything. I'm wondering if it'd be a good opportunity to talk a bit about induction, about um, what to expect with inductions and how that works. Yeah. So um, there's two reasons really for being induced. One is that you might have a, a complication of pregnancy that means that your baby needs to be born before um, your due date or um, before you go into labour yourself or your pregnancy just doesn't seem to want to end. <laughs> so the um, baby's quite happy. Um, oh, so we might induce you just to, um, because the pregnancy has been prolonged. Um, if you're going to have a, an induction for a medical reason, then you'll come into hospital. Um, you can bring your partner with you, that's absolutely fine. You'll be seen by the induction of labour midwife team. Um, you'll be examined and you'll have something called a prostate which will start the induction process. If it's your first baby, you may go on to have a second prostin, um, and this is inserted vaginally. If it's um, your second or subsequent pregnancy, you will only have one, or you possibly don't need any prostin. Um, at some point during that process, you might go into labour yourself, which is great. If that happens, you'll be transferred to the delivery suite, and then everything that more was already explained will happen. 
If you don't go into labour after you've had the prostate, then the next day or the, the earliest opportunity, um, you'll be taken to delivery suites and you'll have your waters broken and you'll start a home and hormone drip. Generally, if you've come in one day and you've had your prostate, you'll go to delivery suite the next day. However, there might be times when um, delivery suite is busy, um, we can't take you straight away, um, and that means that you will be delayed slightly. What we um, envisage to do during that period of time is keep you updated to let you know what's happening um, and keep you informed about the you know, length of time when we think that you might get transferred to delivery suite. Um, during the process, as I say, your partner can be with you and your partner can stay with you up until 8 o'clock at night on the antenatal ward and then um, he will need to leave you and he will be contacted or you will contact him if you go into labour overnight because obviously he can then rejoin you or he can come back at 8 o'clock the next morning and stay, he or she can stay with you the next day. Um, for um, post dates, so you've gone beyond 41 plus um, three days and we're inducing you. The process is very similar. Um, in fact, it's probably, that side of it is probably much the same. If you've got a very high risk pregnancy and they want to induce you, that might actually happen on delivery suite or observation area. Um, so you're already there. Um, otherwise, as I say, you're transferred once you go into labour or once we have a, an available slot to carry on with the process. Um, you can take um, mild pain relief, so you can take paracetamol. During the process, you can use birthing balls, you can move around, you can be as mobile as possible. Um, and you can eat and drink normally whilst you're on the antenatal ward, which is where the induction will take place. So please bring in snacks, um, drinks, anything that you, you would like to have. If you want to add anything else, Laura? It was just talking about the sort of um, delivery suite rooms. You know, when, when you get down to delivery suite or when you come from an AU to delivery suite, you know, you can be there for quite a lengthy stay. So just to let you know, that, that room, those rooms are, are, are your rooms. So it's just we will accommodate anything we can accommodate to make those rooms comfortable for you. So anything, really, anything you want to bring in that's going to remind you of home, going to make you feel more at home. We try and make them as homely as possible, but we can't disguise the fact that sometimes they are clinical rooms and we do need to have clinical equipment in them. But actually, this is it's your room, so we really would like you to take ownership of them. So if, there, if there's anything we can do to support you in that, we will do. And whatever you want to bring in, we're happy um, and we, we, we positively encourage that. And I think I spoke quite quickly about all the things that would happen. I think to just reassure you that at each stage, it will be discussed with you what's going to happen, what's going to happen next, to make sure that you understand what we um, are offering you and that you can give your consent for, for each stage to happen. So although I went through it very quickly, um, we will be spending time with you to explain everything at each stage with you when you're actually with us. Thank you. So Sophie's um, popped a, a question into the chat just asking about the balloon catheter induction. She's um, had one of the leaflets that explains about this uh, and is just wondering the, the difference between the balloon catheter induction and the prostin that we discussed. Okay, so from this week, um, if it's your first baby, then we're offering um, prostin inductions because um, the evidence that we've had um, given to us more recently has suggests that the balloon catheters actually prolong your labour. Um, so you're, you're in labour longer, you're in, in hospital longer. So we've taken the decision that we're going to move to prostate, which we've used in the past, and we've used very successfully in the past. And that's for all um, pregnancies when it's your first baby. We're actually advocating prostate for second and subsequent pregnancies where applicable. However, we're very happy to discuss the use of balloon um, inductions if it's your second or subsequent pregnancy. And that's something you can do with the induction of labour midwife or your community midwife. We're updating our publications at the moment, so there are some leaflets out there that's still advocating balloon induction. Um, and we just, um, I think the, the new leaflet's ready to go. The new, the new, leaflet, the new, leaflet, the new leaflet should be ready to go, yeah. And there are some, we, if, if Sophie would like us to, there is some um, information that we can send to her, which explains the difference between the prostate and the folate as well. Excellent. I think the big difference, um, the, big, the big 
difference that you probably need to be aware of is that with the with the catheter, you could have the catheter inserted and then go home until either you went into labour or until we called you back to delivery suite. With the prostate, you need to stay in hospital um, until you go into labour or until you transfer um, into hospital. So, I'm uh, sorry, to delivery suite. So we shared all this information with community midwives. Um, I think it's because we're just in that transition period at the moment, so the information isn't out there. Um, all the community midwives um, have been made aware of the changes and we'll be sharing that with people. So I think if you could just bear with us over the next week or two whilst we make the transition. Um, but again, as I said previously, your community midwife or your midwife is going to be responsible for your induction. We'll go through each stage with you explain everything to you and make sure you have all the options so you can make the choice that you want. And one of the big drivers of the people in the pandemic was for, for, for the women to stay out of hospital for as, as much as possible and as much as safe to do and the Foley catheter insertion for induction of labour gave us an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So any questions, so if you want an update, do contact your community midwife. Um, so Will's popped a couple of questions into the chat. Um, Will wants to know, is it true that induced labours tend to be very quick and possibly more painful, or do they vary? Oh, I think you've hit the nail on the head. <laughs> do they vary? Yeah. Um, are they quick? Um, not necessarily. I would say induced labours vary. Are they quick? I don't think they make labours any quicker. Um, and you probably, if you if you if you've, if you've spoken to women who've had inductions, they might say they made them longer. But you um, and and are they more painful? Um, I'm, I'm whether I mean that's that's sort of difficult to know whether they're more painful. I think probably the fact that we're interfering, then I think probably what happens is that um, you. You, you don't have all those natural sort of hormones and natural painkillers that you that, that you have when you go into spontaneous labour. And when you have an induction, we, we, we are getting you into labour. So I think probably it's we are moving the goalposts a little bit. So we, we, we start to induce you with the synthetic hormone, we start those contractions, and I think your body is thinking, great, yeah, I'm doing this, yeah, yeah, I can cope with this. And then we decide, actually, we need those contractions to be a little bit stronger. We need them to be a little bit more frequent. And then we, and then we, uh, we increase that um, hormone drug to increase those contractions. And then your body has to catch up again. And I think that's probably what's, um, that's partly what, what is, what, what's going on. I think it's really important as well to think about pain relief really yeah. and what your options might be. Um, if you go into labour spontaneously um, and you have quite a low risk pregnancy to if you have a more complicated pregnancy and if you go to be induced and just so you're aware of what the options are available to you and what you think might be the right thing for you. So Sophie who asked earlier about the balloon catheter induction has thanked you for your your answer so hopefully that has clarified that. Will has also asked um, if the prostate doesn't induce labour do you move on to the hormone drip? Probably. Yes, 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 yes. So if the prostate doesn't induce labour, I, I would say that if you if you have two gels, then you will then labour will labour will normally you'll be you you'll, you'll be getting some uterine activity and that uterine activity um, Will, that will have an effect on your cervix so that we will be able to sort of break your waters and then um, if, 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 if then we have to use a hormone drip, then we, we will use a hormone drip. And we also have the option of breaking the waters as well. So there's sort of three stages to the induction process in terms of the prostin gel, which um, ripens and softens the cervix and gets it ready to go into labour and sends the signals to the body that we are attempting to nudge you into labour. And we then break the waters and what that does is it brings the baby's head down directly onto the cervix and the fluid loss from the uterus causes the uterus to contract and relax 
and then if neither of those things have been enough to nudge you into that full labor process, then that's when we use the syntocinol drip. And the syntocinol drip is a hormone that's given through the vein, and it acts on the smooth muscle of the uterus to cause it to contract and relax at a rate dependent on the number of drops um, per millimeter that we use through the vein. So an induction of labor is us nudging you into labor, but when your body takes over, we can then take a step back and adjust what stage we're at and what we're going to use. There might be some very, very rare occasions when we've started the induction process and actually feel that we aren't achieving what we want to achieve, and we might then start discussing the options of a C-section with you. But, but that is, you know, not that doesn't happen very often, but, but it is a potential for you to consider. Lovely, thank you. We're up to date on questions at the moment. So we've got 31 people watching. It could be that we've got some people just joining us. And just to let you know that we've got our uh, matron for inpatient services, that's antenatal and postnatal services. Um, this is Jane, we've got B, who's our deputy head of midwifery. We've got Laura here, who's the matron for delivery suites, maternity assessment unit and observation area and myself who's the matron for outpatients. So if you have any questions at all, do please pop them in the chat and we'll do our very best to answer them. Uh, we've got a couple come up actually as I've just said that. Um, so Hannah has, has put a question in saying, um, if you've had a cord prolapse, is it likely to happen in your next pregnancy? And if so, what steps would be taken? So I think we should start off with what cord prolapse is, <laughs> in case any people isn't aware. So cord prolapse is when um, your waters um, break and then the, the cord, the umbilical cord, comes through the cervix before your baby comes. So if that happens, it's actually an emergency situation um, because we don't want the, ba the, the cord out and not the baby. Um, and we would, depending on what stage of labor you were in, we would be looking at delivering you very, very quickly, um, usually by an emergency C-section. Um, occasionally, if you're if it's a, a second or subsequent baby and you're in advanced labour and your cervix is fully dilated, your baby will come out very very quickly and um, we wouldn't have a chance to do a C-section. So it is an emergency situation. Um, if that has happened to you, then um, I'm sure it's very frightening, and I can absolutely understand why you'd be concerned about um, subsequent pregnancy. I think a lot. You said about whether it's likely to happen again. I think a lot will depend on why it happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, whether your baby was in uh, not in the head down position. Whether you went into labour before um, your expected date of delivery. So very pre, you know, very pre term. It's more likely to happen. Um, or whether you've got some um, something going on with your uterus that makes it a different shape that sometimes can, can lead to um, a core prolapse. So I think all of those options would need to be explored with your obstetrician. Um, as to whether or not it's likely to happen again. Um, I think if you, occasionally it can happen when your waters are broken for induction, but again, that's quite unusual actually. So I don't think we can sort of say whether it's likely to happen to you again without knowing more of the history, and I really strongly suspect. Actually, popped on the chat to say that um, um, she was actually at 33 weeks. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, it's, it's probably not going to happen again, but anything in obstetrics, I would say, if it's happened once, then it could happen again <laughs> to you, so I wouldn't want to say definitely not. But I think it's one of those questions that you need to, um, my guess is that you, um, uh, being managed, your pregnancy has been managed by an obstetrician if you've had a previous core prolapse, so I think they would be a, a really good person to speak to about the future or your community midwife. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. Anybody want to add anything with that? Um, so Gemma has asked uh, if you're in labour, either spontaneous or induced, and you decide you want a caesarean section whilst in labour, what's the likelihood of being able to, to have your wishes to get your caesarean? Gosh, I mean, I think I think that all depends on why you have changed your uh, why why you have changed your mind, um, and also at what stage of labour um, you are you are at. Um, I mean, obviously, if you were if you were in the sort of um, sort of late later stages of labour and everything was going going according to plan, then actually it's probably then safer to deliver your baby vaginally than it would be by um, a cesarean section. 
But obviously, if you have changed your mind and you feel um, very strongly that you feel like you don't want to labour and you want to have a cesarean section, then that will be discussed at the time. And that will be discussed by you, your partner, um, the obstetrician and the midwife caring for you. So it would be a discussion and all your options would, would be explored. So it wouldn't be a no, but it, it, would be, it would be doing the best thing for you, supporting you and making sure that you and your, the options that you decide means that they're the safest, safest, safest options for you and your baby. Thank you, thank you. So Hannah, who asked us the questions about that, has, um, has thanked you for the answer. She's actually going to speak to a consultant. She's got a lady consultant, so she's going to speak, um, speak to him. Lovely. We're up to date with questions, so we am aware that we're down to our last 15 minutes. So do pop your questions in the chat if there is anything you do want to ask about um, postnatal antenatal admissions, um, inpatient care, uh, delivery, uh, suite issues, MAU questions. Um, pop them into the chat, and Gemma's just thanked you for the answer about the cesarean section. We're up to date with questions just now. I think it'd be good to go um, around the team and just ask them, um, put them on the spot a little bit, and say if you were going to give one little bit of advice or one bit of information to, to um, the people that are watching about coming in, is there anything that you would advise, something special to bring in with them? or? I, I, for me, for postnatal, I think um, have as much information as you possibly can about feeding. I think that, as I said before, you, when you're pregnant, you, you're thinking about the labour and the birth and obviously welcoming this beautiful baby into the world and, and often it's quite difficult to think beyond the birth. So I think to get as much information as possible about you know, feeding would be really, really good. Be really sure about what you want and what you need in order to achieve that. I noticed um, Laura mentioned um, very early on in today's um, conversations about one-to-one -one care and labour. When you're on the delivery suite and you're in labour, then you have one midwife assigned to you um, exclusively for that length of time. When you move to the postnatal ward, you have one midwife or nurse assigned to you, and she'll also be assigned. She also have another two of the seven people that she's responsible for, mums and babies. So you won't be getting one-to-one -one care on the postnatal ward. You will have to wait for help um, because it won't be instantaneous, like it is on the delivery suite. So again, think about that, think about mechanisms of coping, um, some strategies in place whilst you're waiting for the support that you need. That would be my advice. Thanks, Jane. B? For me, it was two, can I do two? You can do two. Okay. Absolutely. So um, your little, the little bag that you bring in, be really organised about what you put into that bag because it will make that inpatient stay, that labour and delivery much less stressful if you know that you've got <coughs> <clears throat> the nappies that you want to use if you know you, you've got that special little vest that you want little one put in um, that makes it really special um, also just um, from personal memory one of the things <laughs> one of the things that was really helpful is um, we had a dog at home so the first vest that my daughter wore went home to the dog um, so that the pet could become used to those smells and um, that interaction then when um, when I brought my daughter home with, with our dog was um, was really lovely actually and one 18, 19 years later I still remember. Um, and then those things that make that, that nest and that nice place to be in labour and afterwards. So bringing in um, something from home that means something special to you, bringing in some little you know, battery tea light candles and making that little nest, making it a special place. So those are mine. That was three, actually. Oh, we have three, though. It's fine. Yeah. As it's your first Facebook. I know. Not, <laughs> not following the rules. Sorry, Emma. Laura. And I would say, if you're coming on to Delivery Suite, just keep a really open mind. Um, when, you, when you get on to Delivery Suite, babies have a habit of doing what they want to do and they don't they don't want to listen to us at times. <laughs> so I would say, have your birth plan, bring your birth plan in, discuss it with your midwife so that she's aware of what your birth plan is, 
And then as, you're, as, as a labour progresses, you can make adaptations to that birth plan. And then I would say just ask questions. Anything that comes into mind when you're with your midwife, when you're in the delivery room, ask those questions and just keep a discussion going because we will support you um, in, 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 in what you want what you, and what you need. Um, but just have that really open mind. And if you have that birth plan, then just discuss it as soon as you get on to delivery suite with your midwife or when you're in on MAU and just share that information with us. We will read it if it's in your in your notes, but actually having that discussion means that if things do change, then we can adapt your birth plan to that change. I think that's a good point as well to take up about things do change. So information or advice you might be given on one day, the next day different information or advice might be given and it's not because the information on day one was incorrect, it's just the situation has changed and things have moved on I think often people think they're getting um, they use the word conflicting advice or different advice it is different but it's because we've moved on in time and the situation has changed so I think just be mindful that you will be given different information depending on where you are in your journey and I think that applies to labour as well as the postnatal yeah. experience I think what I'd say is um, ask the questions that are in your mind. There is never a daft yeah. question to ask at any yeah. time. There's never a stupid question. If you if something is worrying you at any point in your pregnancy or postnatal period, if something's concerning you, then ask. Call into MAU. Ask your community midwife. But there is always someone that will be able to yeah. answer your question, so never feel afraid to ask. And I would say sometimes we can seem really busy and we're rushing around, but I, and, and sometimes it's really difficult because I you often hear women saying, "Oh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to ask because you were too busy." Please, please ask because we we want to be able to reassure you and to answer your questions. And I know that we seem busy at times, but you know we we're more than happy to stop. And, um, and, 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 and have a discussion with you. And nobody knows you better than you. And um, it often, you know, if you feel something or want to share something or discuss something, then please do that because we, we might not pick up on those vibes. We might not recognise that that's something that's important to you. So we need you to be open and honest and share what you're thinking and feeling with us um, at the time, and then we can do something about it. Um, yeah, that would that's really, that be helpful if you could do that or think about that. Thank you. We're upping our viewers as we're going along. We've got 35 people watching now. Um, so Will has popped a question in. Um, could you explain what to expect in terms of postnatal recovery? Um, a lot depends on what type of birth you've had, whether you've had um, a very a quick, um, normal vaginal birth, whether you've had a full sex delivery, whether you've had a C-section. Um, it really does depend on how quickly you're going to recover, how you're going to feel, um, whether you've been in labour for, for hours and hours or whether you just came through the doors of MAU and birthed <laughs> in MAU. Um, it just happened occasionally. Um, so I think it, I think probably it's, it's so general, it's, it's worth talking to your community midwife about if you've got concerns. I mean, we'll, we'll, there'll be certain expectations. We'll want to make sure you can pass urine. We'll want to make sure that your blood loss is normal. We want to make sure that um, you're comfortable, that you can feed your baby. Um, and this is all variable. It takes, um, it, it's different for everybody. We yeah. want to make sure your wound's healing, whether that's um, a C-section wound or whether it's wound for um, suturing, if you're perineum, if you've if you given birth vaginally. Um, there's, there's quite a lot that needs to happen to happen and it's re everyone's different some people will, will you know be completely uneventful and will hardly notice that they're given birth whereas other people you know they're incredibly uncomfortable afterwards and it takes much longer so it's a huge range well huge I, I would agree it's very yeah. individual it's it, yeah. it's 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 really individual and, and women they're all different yeah. one thing that um, it's probably worth mentioning is that we will encourage you to mobilize um, whether that's a C-section or a normal birth, we want you up and about, moving around and, um, as quickly and as soon as possible. And um, that's because your recovery will be enhanced by your mobilising. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest risks to, to postnatal women is blood clots. And if you're mobilising, um, then that reduces the risk. So that is really important that you do that. So it's not that we 
we're trying to be difficult or we want to make things more harder for you, it's really important that you do get up and move around as, as soon as possible. And we will support you to do that. Great, right, thank you. So Kiara's um, popped a, a question in. She had her baby um, on the delivery suites in March and would really like to send a card to the midwives that cared for her. But she doesn't know their surnames and not sure um, who to write to. Are you happy for Kiara yes. to write to you? So if you to yeah. You? Kiara, if you send me an email and then I will, I can actually give you the surnames of the um, midwives. Or if you want to send me an email with your telephone number, then I will give you a call. And my email, and I'm sure Emma can put it in the chat as well, is laura.jones at ouh.nhs.uk. And if you want to send me your phone number if it's easier, then I'll give you a quick call um, and then we can um, work out how best way to, how, how the best way to get the card to the staff. Perfect, I hope that helps. Um, so Hayley's popped um, uh, in saying that she had a, um, an extremely quick labour and delivery last time and she was currently 36 weeks pregnant with baby number three. If she goes into spontaneous labour, she's nervous about not making it to hospital. Um, but does she, if she just suddenly rushes in, can she just present to MAU? Yes, that's all right. Yes, absolutely. If you feel that, um, yeah. So if you called um, MAU and you gave them your history, then they would have, they would have a very low um, they would have a le- very low threshold to invite you in. If you feel like you've gone into labour and you've got to get there, absolutely, then you can actually just present to MAU. That won't be a problem at all. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget your notes in the brush. Yes, <laughs> your notes. Oh, yes that's a really good point. Your notes, your bags, and your We're down to the very last two minutes, and it seems like we've come to a natural end on, on questions. Kiara has thanked you for your answer um, about the midwives, finding out who helped her. So I think that is probably um, time for us to say a thank you and goodbye. Thank you for bearing with us. We're sorry that there was a change of plan. um, And we will get advertised um, in plenty of time what's happening in two weeks' time on our our questions um, session then. In between times, we've got the the infant feeding team who will be doing their regular sessions as well. But uh, thank you very much from myself. From the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Bye. Bye.